Hey there, Vince here, and welcome to yet another Circuit Rewind. So today I want to cover a retro keyboard, specifically this thing right here. But before I get into it, like whenever I show off this keyboard, the very first thing people ask me is like, hey, isn't that that new retro keyboard that came out by whatever that company was called? Well, no, that would be the 8 Do retro keyboard here but its color scheme is actually modeled after this other one. And so let's get into what this original keyboard was and why it exists and why I have it and what I'm doing with it today. So this keyboard is the Famicom Family Computer Keyboard. But what is that? Let's go over a little bit of a history lesson here. Late 70s, early 80s, video game industry was crashing, if you could believe it or not. Today, video games are more profitable than music, movies, any other form of entertainment. But back then, the video game industry just flat out crashed. And Nintendo still wanted to enter it over in Japan, and so they didn't want to create a video game console. So they wanted to appeal more to um, the other ideals of consumers, and so they wanted to create a family computer, or the Famicom. And then when they brought it over to the United States, they called it the Nintendo Entertainment System. Not a video game console, but an entertainment system to be more in that broad entertainment realm. Like it could do all sorts of new, wonderful, magical things. But historically speaking, we know it's a video game console now. But in Japan, before that, like I said, they wanted to make it a family computer. And so they had different things that it can do. In that era, computers like the TI-99 4A, the Commodore 64, the ZX Spectrum, things like that, they all could do something called running BASIC. And BASIC was just a very simple and basic programming language that you can use to make code, print things to the screen, make little games, things like that. And so Nintendo, with their Famicom in Japan, they wanted to do the same thing, and so they made Family BASIC. But if you think about it, an NES controller or a Famicom controller, that'd be a really, really terrible way to input characters and type characters onto a screen. Like, we've done it with name entry screens on games like Zelda or Tetris High Score screens, things like that. So when they produced and released Family Basic for the Famicom, they also produced a keyboard for it that you can plug in and use that for typing. And that just so happens to be what I have right here. And I want to get more into this keyboard, but before, I want to talk about what I wanted to do with the keyboard and why I have it sitting here. PDX Land happens twice a year nowadays, and I created a really cool video from PDX Land Fall 2023 interviewing a bunch of people and having them tell their stories. And I wanted to share um, the stories of the people there, and one of the stories that came up was the keyboard meetup. So people bring their modern keyboards uh, like their mechanical keyboards to show off different types of keys, different layouts, different interfaces, things like that. And so other people can experiment with them, see what they like, and go out and get keyboards of their own and get sucked into that massive hobby. Well, I wanted to go the opposite direction and bring one of the oldest keyboards that my family owns, which is the family computer keyboard. But the problem is, is that it uses this DA15 connector. I wanted to use it on a modern computer, but I didn't have a way to do it because it's a completely archaic style where there's no, um, there, there's no way to plug it into a modern computer. So with this being Circuit Rewind, I did what I do best, and I rewound to create my own circuit for plugging this thing into a modern PC. And this jumbled mess, holy crap, what it was was essentially an extension cable for the family computer keyboard, or also, coincidentally, the Neo Geo uses the exact same plug for their controller. So you can get an extension cable for either. I did what I did in a previous video for NES and uh, SNES adapters. I just cut the wire in half, used a continuity tester to figure out which pin corresponded to which color on the, the different wires coming out of it. And then I soldered it to an RP2040, specifically the WaveShare RP2040-0. So it's a tiny little board, and then I put some heat shrink over it to kind of make it all protected. And then that gives me a nice USB-C interface to plug this into a PC. And then I wrote some firmware to make this thing work. So this was the second iteration. The first iteration was done on a breadboard. And what was important about that transition is the Famicom runs on 5-volt logic, but Raspberry Pis, the RP2040, runs on 3.3-volt logic. Well, that means I'm going to have to have a bunch of logic shifters 
to take the three volt signal and put it out to five volt into the uh, keyboard. And then when the five volt signal of the key press has come back, convert that back down to three volt, right? So I looked up the data sheet on the Famicom keyboard and it turns out it only has three chips inside of it. Really simple old technology back then, right? And then I looked at the data sheet on each of those three chips. They all have to be from Texas Instruments. And each and every one of them said that they actually had a very, very wide voltage tolerance range. So basically, they could all go all the way down to three volts. And like I said, it's actually 3.3 volts coming out of the, the, uh, the RP2040. I'm like, all right, cool. Can I get rid of the logic shifters and plug it straight into the board? And it worked. So that's actually what this is here, the second iteration, where I was able to solder those wires directly to the, the wave share here. As you can see, like I can, I can type, and if I type on it, we can actually see the, the key presses there. Nice and awesome. But wait, th this is sitting here, it's not plugged in. How is that working? Well, what I did afterwards, is I decided to take that exact design there. So it's literally just wires from the, the pins going directly into specific headers on the, the WaveShare board, right? So I went and uh, just real quick in, in CAD, I drew up the schematics for this tiny little board here for the WaveShare to plug into. And it has some headers on the edge of the board for the socket to slide onto and get soldered onto it. Upload the firmware to this and we have ourselves a USB keyboard adapter. So let's talk problems, and that's why I have both keyboards sitting here. This thing is a hot mess. It's fun, but it's a hot mess. Uh, the first thing I want to cover is the keys are about 30% smaller than normal keys. That is a pain if you're used to the size of normal keys and you have muscle memory for how far you need to move a finger or just how you center yourself on a key with your fingers. This is a real, real pain to get used to. On top of that, I personally use an ergonomic keyboard, so this is doubly bad for me. The layout is entirely wonky. So we have the normal QWERTY layout, we have the normal number layout, and then everything else is basically different. For instance, the escape key is where tab should be. There isn't a tab key. Control is where your caps lock should be. There's this graph button down here, but I have that remapped to Super or Windows or whatever you want to call it. And then we have like a bunch of extra keys on the right-hand side. Like there's no backspace, there's a stop key. Stop is actually mapped to backspace because I can read the keys however I want and map them whatever I want to do. And then like the arrow keys are not a configuration you're going to see in a modern keyboard. But the other wonky thing is something called ghosting. And what I have up on the screen here is specifically the Microsoft Windows ghosting test. And this is just a web page that they have. You can go to this web page. I'll link it down below. Go there and test out your keyboard and see how it does. So what I want to show you is I'm going to hold A and then S and then hit D. And as I hit D, you can see um, it's not doing what, it, what you think it should do. And I'm going to release D and do that again. That is known as ghosting. Uh, the other thing is this specific interface and this driver can only handle up to six key presses at once. But as you can tell, certain combinations of keys, because of how it's physically wired inside, causes all sorts of incorrect signals to, to be sent. Any one or two, I believe any two key presses should register correctly, but once you get three or more, depending on where they are on the board, they can interfere to, with each other. This keyboard uses what's known as a matrix inside of it. So there are 18 columns and four rows. Any key within a column and any key within a row has an, a chance to affect each other when it's trying to read the signal from one or the other. This can also only handle six simultaneous key presses at a time because of a limitation of the original HID USB protocol. I am looking at possibly using a newer version of the HID protocol, but I haven't quite gotten there yet. But at least keeping it in this mode means it will work in a BIOS versus the newer protocol usually doesn't. That means if I press like a lot of keys at once, you can see that it just, there's only gonna be so much on the screen. All right, let's swap to the modern keyboard. The 8-bit do keyboard, which again, the color scheme is kind of loosely modeled off the Famicom. They also make a model that's modeled off the NES color scheme, which is awesome. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna lay my hand across a bunch of keys. And as you can see, this keyboard has no ghosting at all. Every single key is individually addressable, which is, that's how high-end gaming keyboards are built today. That's what actually separates them apart from these cheaper keyboards. And you notice I was testing with WASD and even Microsoft's ghosting test website here mentions using the WASD keys 
uh, because that is a known ghosting area, but that's also what we use for movement in video games. So like if you play FPS games like I do, like Unreal Tournament, you might have problems with it. Which brings us back to PDX LAN. Like I said, I wanted to take this to the keyboard meetup, and I did. So I'll show some footage of that at the end of this video. It turns out I was using an older version of the libraries for the RP2040 when I built the first controller for this board. And that specific one actually had bugs with its keyboard interface. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to unplug this and actually plug it into the old one that still has that old firmware. And let's see if we can cause some bugs to happen. And for this, I'm actually going to stand up because I, I need to be able to see the screen for this one. Okay, so that was a little bit of a pain to do, but uh, this does actually happen quite frequently. As you can see, it thinks a key is currently being held down and it's not. So there was a bug in the old software that it would not always send key releases correctly. So it thinks a key is just infinitely being held down. And that really, really screwed up a lot of gameplay because this would actually happen with the WASD keys. I would take my hand off the keyboard, my character is still running around the screen. That uh, becomes a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> Another quick thing I want to do is the sound of these two keyboards. So you can get an idea of how 40 year separates the design and engineering of two different keyboards. So let's try this out with my microphone. So one of the things I love best about this mod that I've done here is the fact that th this is a no-cut mod, it's just an adapter. Um, another question I get very, very common with this when using this keyboard is, what did I have to modify or change the internals of to get it to work on a modern PC? And it turns out that no, all you really need is just a little microcontroller and that's enough to get this thing to work on a PC. So if you want to do this yourself, I will link the GitHub repo down below that has all of the files for this. But also be aware that the current pinout that I have, I'm actually planning on changing because I have some extra enhanced features that I want to do. And also there was, uh, let's just say some minor problems with this revision of the board that I've had to work out in software that will actually be fixed in another hardware revision. And in that next hardware revision, um, I'd already planned on before I discovered those, before these boards arrived in the mail, because I have an update. I'm gonna have a V2 of this board that can do some more really cool things that I want to cover in a future video. So hit subscribe to um, whatever the hell you do these days with YouTube to get notifications about the next iteration of this board. And speaking of future videos, right before I go, just like in my last video, I've had the Jenkinator sitting here, the next Jenkinator this entire time. I promise you, in one or two more videos, this will be the highlight. And yes, all of these keyboard tests I'm doing right now are on the Jenkinator. But there are some really cool, awesome, magical, special things with this computer. It's working really, really well now. So I am basically ready to record that video. Maybe I'll start working on that next weekend. Uh, but in the meantime, I hope you enjoy the, uh, the Famicom adapter. Um, let me know in the comments down below if you have one of these keyboards and you're interested in buying one of these. Because I might produce a few of the V2 of these boards, the next iteration, uh, for them to be sold. We will see. But until then, take care, everyone. Yeah, like you have to like bottom them out to get them to register. It's it's really really bad. And they're so small too. Yeah. It's 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 for children. Oh, horrible! <laughs> is there a... I think uh, stop is bound to backspace. The stop is bound to backspace, yeah.